Good morning, church. I pray everyone is doing well, continuing to seek after Christ, continuing to pray, uh, uh, and continuing to pray that God would heal our land and that COVID would go away. That's what we are praying for. That's what we are asking God to do. And so uh, with that being said, um, I'm saying that I'm praying that you will continue to do that. Uh, and I'm praying that uh, that eventually, and, and I mean sooner than later, God will bring us back into this sanctuary. Um, but until then, uh, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing. Uh, and as always, gather around, uh, grab your friends, grab your family, whoever's in the house, uh, gather around the device you are using to watch this, and grab your Bibles, and let's hear from the Lord together. Share this video for someone who needs to hear the gospel, uh, That whatever it, whatever it takes, whatever you need to do to continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, let's make sure that we are doing that consistently. Uh, with that being said, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. We are continuing in our Acts series. Uh, we're done with Simon, y'all. We're done with Simon. We are going to verse 25. Verse 25. We are done with Simon, but we are working our way to Philip's second uh, uh, mission or second assignment uh, in a little bit. Uh, so Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Uh, and as always, before we get into anything, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. I pray, Lord, even now that you would use me for your glory. Father, that uh, that you would anoint these clay lips, oh Lord, that you would help my, uh, that you would use me, and that my words would be concise, that my words would be, uh, 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 my words would be cor uh, correct, that they would understand, oh God, clearly what your word is saying, Father. And I pray, consecrate our hearts, oh Lord, uh, consecrate our hearts to hear your word, not only be hearers of them, but doers of them, of your word, oh God, and that you would change our hearts, Lord, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray even now, God, if there are any sins, Lord, that we need to repent of, Lord, we repent of those sins. Father, so that we may, uh, so that we may uh, hear your word, Father, and anything that's hindering us, oh God, from hearing your word and accepting it, Father, I pray that you would, uh, you would remove those distractions, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Let this seed fall on good ground. Father, bless this moment, Father, and we thank you even now that your word will not return to you void. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Acts chapter 8. Verse 25 through 29, uh, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. We're going to be in, in the, uh, the, this final portion of Acts chapter 8 just this week and next week. So we're not going to, well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what the Lord says. But I'm pretty sure it's these two, uh, the, this week and the following week. But Acts chapter 8, verse 25 to, through 29, and, uh, and it reads like this, verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This, this is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. I want to preach from these words and I pray you're paying attention because this is going to be a very practical sermon. Preaching from these words. Evangelism is evangelism is, and you can put some dots there. You'll probably see it uh, um, in the title. Evangelism is, um, and I pray you're paying attention. Help me, Holy Spirit, to preach your word. I need you, God. The book of Acts holds the historical moments of the beginning of the church. It is in the book of Acts that we'll find Jesus's mission on earth coming to an end but his mission will continue in heaven, seated at the right hand of God as our intercessor and, 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 as, um, and having sovereign rule over everything. It is in the book of Acts that God would no longer reign in a physical temple, but would reign in us, his people, where we would become his temple. Help me, Holy Spirit. It is in the book of Acts that the great commission that we find in Matthew 28, which we'll read later, uh, would, would be put into action. 
and the church would begin to grow through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so throughout the book of Acts, which is why I believe God led us to this book, we will find a continued theme, watch this, of apostles and people, meaning the church, unashamedly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who does not believe. One more time, that's, that's the book, the whole point of the book of Acts, and, and this is really what I believe the whole point, the reason why we are in this text, uh, is because uh, throughout the book of Acts, uh, uh, we will find a continued theme of apostles and people rather uh, in the church unashamedly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who does not believe. So what does that mean for us? The same unashamed proclamation that they give in the book of Acts is still required of us today. The Great Commission is is still the mission of the church. One more time for the people in the back. The Great Commission is still the mission of the church. Matthew 28, 19, 19 through 20. Therefore, and, uh, uh, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That, that, that is what Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And, and that is, what, uh, that is what, instruct, what is instructed of us to this day. Praise God for us gathering together. We need that as a church. And I pray that we'll be able soon. I'm, I'm really praying that God would bring us back here. And we even praise God for the feeding of the community because we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Praise God for all the things that we do here. But the whole point of all the things that we do as a church is that the whole point of the outreach is for souls to be saved. There is actually a technical term for it. I said it in my title, if you caught it. The technical term for souls being saved. The, out, the whole point of spreading the gospel. What is spreading the gospel? The technical term, uh, term of it is called evangelism. Evangelism is what happens when we tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Evangelism. Here, here's my sermon in the sentence. Here it is. Evangelism is reaching people in irregular places to give them the gospel. Evangelism is reaching people in irregular places to give them the gospel. Th this is what is required of us as the church. Again, this is our mission. Now, let me, uh, let's bring it to 2020 because uh, I'm not, I don't want to uh, I don't want us to think that uh, we are not understanding the situation that we're in now. Help me, Holy Spirit. Now, it may seem difficult right now to have a conversation with someone with a mask uh, and, and 10 feet apart. But there are some of us, I believe, that are still working, still around people, uh, being cautious, obviously, whether you're talking to people behind the glass or uh, having a glass in between you or whether you are uh, virtual, uh, uh, your meetings are virtual and, you're, and everything is over Zoom call. But, uh, but no matter the circumstance, no matter what is happening in the world, the mission of the church in the world is still the same. The method may change, but the mission of the message stays the same. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. Uh, again, I'm praying that God will remove COVID-19. Uh, in fact, and we and, and the church union, we are we are all praying. But I really believe, if I can be honest with you, that COVID-19 served a purpose. Um, and you'll hear me say this again. God, I really believe, and we already know that all things work together. God does not do anything by accident. I believe that COVID happened to challenge us, if you will, to wake us up. Because I believe that we got real comfortable in this building. Help me, Holy Spirit. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? I believe that we got real comfortable inviting people to a, inviting people to a building Knowing they would get the gospel in our church, in our, in our church services, instead of engaging possibly in a conversation 
that will lead people to Jesus in an irregular place. Some of us would say, uh, come to my church when God, when maybe, and, and here's my challenge to you, maybe God is saying, I, uh, inviting them is great. And we're going to get to this again later. Inviting them is great. And I'm not saying don't do that. But maybe God is saying, why don't you talk to them right there in Walmart? Why don't you talk to them right there in the aisle at ShopRite? I know you got your mask on. Keep your mask on. Make sure your cart and their cart are in between you two. But still, God is challenging us. And I believe that's why God allowed COVID. I believe that's why God says, ah, everybody out the building because we got too comfortable here. The spreading of the message became, the spreading of the message became inviting people to church instead of having conversation. Forcing the church to spread the gospel without a central building to do so. And yet the mission still goes on and is still required of us. If you're still watching, I hope you are. Uh, 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 if we are to continue the mission of spreading the gospel to our neighbors, friends and family, to all who are unsaved and to do this and, and, and to do this effectively, we have to ask the question of what is required of us. This text is going to answer that, answer that question, and I pray that you are with me. Here we go. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Peter has just told Simon to repent for what he did. Uh, repent for uh, he did not receive Jesus as Savior, uh, but wanted him for his power. Remember, we, we literally preached, um, uh, almost I think it was a month, a month of that, four weeks of Simon. If you do not know Simon now, then you must have had this sermon on mute and just have me looking at you because we have it's all in there. Uh, but but the, but the text now the text does not say what happened to Simon. We do not know. We there's nothing to assume. We can't we can't say. But the text move on, moves on and the story continues uh, as we are looking at Peter and John. Look, let's look right at verse 25 as the story continues with what happens after Simon. Verse 25 says, now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, meaning Peter, John and Peter, John and Philip. Remember, Peter and John had uh, came from Jerusalem. They sent for Peter and John so they can lay hands and that the people so the people would receive the Holy Spirit after being baptized and receive and hearing the gospel from Philip. So Peter and John, help me, Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord. Peter and John uh, uh, um, um, come down. Uh, uh, or a matter of fact, they're going back with Philip to Jerusalem. And watch what it says. They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. May not seem like a lot, but I'm going somewhere. The apostles Peter and John, remember, laying hands on the Samaritans. They have received Jesus and they're on their way back. But as they are on their way back, they are preaching to the Samaritan towns. I wish I, I, I'm going to reference this a lot. I wish I could show you a map. If you got a study Bible, look uh, in your map. Look for Judea and, Samar and, and Samaria. And what you'll find is Jerusalem, uh, Sam uh, the Samaritan city is like up, is up here, if you will, up north. And they are traveling down to, uh, so Samaritan city is up north. And they're, they're traveling down uh, to Jerusalem. But as they are traveling down, they are making it their business to preach the gospel intentionally to every Samaritan town they pass. Can I, can, let me, let me bring the 2020, let me, let me give you a New Jersey map. Maybe y'all know if I travel up north to Jersey City and as I'm coming down from Jersey City, I stop off at East Orange. Let me see if I got my, 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 my stuff right. I stop off at East Orange. I make my, somehow make my way to Newark. I'll continue to go down till I get to Central Jersey. Every exit that I pass, I am going and I'm preaching the gospel. Going and I'm preaching the gospel. Some of y'all know the parkway. Uh, exit 130. I hit Westfield right all the way down until I get to Central Jersey. Exit 8A. Amen. That, that's, 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 that's what they did. But here, what's my point? My point is they didn't just preach the gospel in Samaria. Help me, Holy Spirit. They didn't just preach the gospel in Samaria and then just go back to Jerusalem. But they were intentional. They, they were intentional. They, you're going to hear me say this multiple times. They didn't wait for people to come to them, but they went to the people. Help me, Holy Spirit. Here, what's my point? 
Evangelism is intentional. We are not waiting for people to ask about Jesus, but we are looking for people to tell about Jesus. One more time for the people in the back. You're going to hear me say this multiple times. We are not waiting for people to ask about Jesus, but we are looking for people to tell about Jesus. Being intentional in my evangelism and spreading the gospel means I'm not waiting for convenience, but I'm looking for opportunity. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. We are actively looking for opportunities to share. We are looking for openings in conversations where we where we can possibly tell someone about Jesus. Now, but, but let me let me make this clear before y'all get fired up, because I know y'all ready already. Let, let me tell you this. Uh, this does not mean that every conversation you have starts with where. So where do you think you're going to go when you die? No, that's 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 not how you start. That's not how you have a conversation. But but and the truth of the matter is people want, ain't going to want to talk to you if you deep like that all the time. You listen, you just want to get to know the person. You just want to, they're not an objective. They're a regular person, just like you and me. They have problems, just like you and me. They just, they, you, they, they are, they're, they're people and they have situations. Talk to them like a normal person. Ask them how their day is. And, and, but I want you to understand, being intentional in evangelism means that I, that I, in my conversations, in asking how the day is, in their worries, in our conversations, so we are asking the Lord, Lord, in the midst of that conversation, show me where I can talk to them about you. That's what it means to be intentional. But can I go a little deeper? Can I go deeper? Getting, uh, we're getting to know people. But I'm not only having conversations, but I'm, watch this, being intentional in evangelism means I'm praying for people. Be being intentional in my evangelism means I am praying that God would give me an opportunity, but I'm also praying that God would work on their heart as I am talking to them. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, say, let me ask you this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. I'm just going to be a lot of challenging today. So, so be ready. But, but, but when was the last time you prayed for your co-worker to get saved? That's, when, when was the last time you prayed for, for that person you've been talking? Are they on your prayer list? Intentional evangelism means that I have a prayer list filled with names of people who don't know Christ. That, that, that's what it looks like when our evangelism is intentional. I'm not just looking for opportunities in the workplace, but before I go to bed, when I hit my, when my knees hit the ground, I am praying, Lord, would you give me an opportunity and would you work on the heart of my coworker? Colossians chapter four, verses two through six says, continue steadfastly. Paul is talking to the church of Colosseum. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, watch this, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Watch what he instructs them as well. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We are actively praying. We are actively seeking people, actively uh, uh, seeking people and opportunities to tell people about Jesus. Evangelism is intentional. Does that make sense? I pray it does. I pray it does. Verse 25, Peter, John, and Philip are on their way back to Jerusalem, but God stops Philip. I, I really do love this. God stops Philip, gives him a different assignment. <laughs> yes, he does. Look at, look at verse 26. They're, they're on their way back to Jerusalem. But as they're on their way uh, uh, down to Jerusalem, uh, Philip, God looks at Philip and says, Philip, I know you want to keep preaching with Philip and well, keep preaching with Peter and John, but I got something different for you. Look at verse 26. Watch what he says. Watch what the angel of the Lord says to Philip. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south. So the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is a desert place. Peter and John are on their way to Jerusalem, and they are preaching the gospel to all the villages. 
But God stops Philip and says, listen, I don't want you to continue with, watch this. He says, I don't want you to continue with the revival that is happening with Peter and John. He said, that's, uh, that, that's good. It looks great. But they got that under control. They got that locked down. He, God looks at, God tells Philip, listen, I need you to get off the, the revival tour bus, if you will. Take your name off the flyer. I know they were supposed to have uh, a, a Samaritan Baptist church. There was supposed to be a revival featuring P, uh, Apostle Peter, Apostle John, and Evangelist Philip. But you, you come off that, you come off that revival. Tell, tell them to send somebody else because I got something else for you to do. I need you to go down south. I need you to pass by Jerusalem. Keep going down, and I need you to hit Gaza. But what's so interesting about Gaza? Watch this. Hallelujah. Help me, Holy Spirit. Scripture says that Gaza is a desert place. What makes what makes Gaza difficult is because number one, difficult. Uh, it's difficult because Gaza is a desert place, meaning it makes it very hard for people to travel, uh, and it can be dangerous with bandits and whatnot. Not only that, but number two, Gaza is Philistine territory. Y'all know about the Philistines. You go to First Samuel. Uh, for, uh, you go to First Samuel around the middle, of, uh, maybe around ten or twelve, somewhere around there. David would fight the Philistines. The Philistines throughout the Old Testament would be fierce enemies to Israel. Well, Gaza is in that area. Well, what does God do? God looks at Philip and he says, though it may be a difficult and irregular journey, I need you to go down to Gaza to preach the gospel. God, watch me. God sends Philip on assignment to preach the gospel. Don't miss this. It's this very important. Don't miss this. God sends Philip on assignment to preach the gospel. And the same way that God sends Philip with an assignment, we too have an assignment. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to get to my I'm going to say this because this is very important. Listen, listen, listen. This, I'm, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this. Preachers are not the only one with assignments. Help me, Holy Spirit. Preachers are not the only ones with assignments. You too. I'm pointing at you. You see me, right? You see my finger? Good. You too have an assignment. Watch this. Here it is. As believers. Help me, Holy Spirit, to preach your word. I need you, God. As believers in Christ. We all have an assignment as, uh, as ambassadors for Christ. Help me, Holy Spirit. All right, did you hear what I just said? I'm going to say it one more time for the people in the back and the people in the balcony. As believers in Christ, we all have an assignment as ambassadors for Christ. What does it mean to be an ambassador, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. I had to Google it, but I did it, and I'm going to tell you what it means. It, uh, an ambassador is an, uh, an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to representative to a foreign country. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Let me put it to you in kingdom terms. It means that everyone who has been saved by the blood of Jesus has become a citizen of the kingdom, and everyone who has become a citizen of the kingdom is also a kingdom representative to this world. One more time, it means that every single one of us who has been saved by the blood of Jesus has become a kingdom citizen and everyone who is a kingdom citizen is now a representative in this foreign world. We are not just sojourners passing through, but we are ambassadors with a message. Hallelujah. What's my point? The, my, again, the same way that God sent Philip on assignment to give the gospel, we too are on assignment to preach the gospel. Every person that is that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb has become a kingdom citizen. Therefore, you are an ambassador. If you are a sojourner passing through, waiting to go to your real home, heaven, then you are indeed an ambassador in this world. Everyone has an assignment. And you know what? Just like Philip, that assignment may require you to go to unfamiliar places. Shout out to Sister Allie. 
Shout, shout out to Sister Ali and, and Ghana, or is it, I, I think it's Ghana. I always get it mixed up. It's Ghana and Nigeria. But shout out to Sister Ali. I know she's overseas. She, we've been praying for her. But, 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 and it may not be uncomfortable for her, but it's uncomfortable for me to go over there. So I'm praying for it. We got, amen. But, but, but God may send us like Sister Ali to uncomfortable, unlikable places. Watch me because you're on assignment. What's my assignment, pastor? Here it is. Your assignment is someone needs to hear the gospel. Ah. No, but now I want you to notice something. I'm really going to get in trouble today. But I want you to notice what God says to Philip. God looks at Philip. He says, Philip, I know you want to join in. Help me, God. You want to join in on the revival that's already taking place. But he says, no, I don't need you to join in a revival. I need you to start one. Ah, help me, Holy Spirit. That, that's, that's why. That's the whole point of evangelism. Evangelism isn't going to preach to people that, are, that have already been reached and already know the gospel. Evangelism is talking to the people that have not been reached. That, don't get me wrong. Do, should we be preaching that other church? Absolutely. We need to be encouraged. We need the word of God. Yes, that we need the gathering. I am not, uh, I am not uh, arguing any of those things. But what I am saying is the point of evangelism is to, is to go to places that God sends us so that we will reach the unreached people. The people in Samaria were already occupied with preachers. There was no reason for Philip to stay. Why? Because the people have already been reached. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, right after the death of Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, what happens after the persecution took place? The text says that the church scattered. Why did the church scatter? It's the same reason why I believe the church was scattered today. One of the reasons. There are many other reasons, and God knows 90% of them. I only know about one. The, the, and my one is this. The reason why COVID happened is to show us that we've got to reach unreached places. Sunday morning ain't enough. It's Monday through Saturday where we've got to preach the gospel. Where is your pulpit? Hallelujah. Mine's right here, but I got other places that I can go. Uh, uh, jobs where I speak to people. Where's your pulpit? Is it in the classroom? Is it, in the, is it at Target? Is it at Walmart? Is it in the hospital? Wherever it is, God says, I sent you on assignment. That's where you are to preach. Ah, I'm not trying to yell at you. I'm just excited. We are on assignment to preach the gospel to everyone that we see. And God will send you to irregular places to, to, the, to reach the unreached people to fulfill that assignment. Ah, can I, can I, I'm going to take it one step further and then I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to take it because my foot's been on the gas. God will send you to jobs. God will send you grocery shopping. <laughs> And that obviously you go on grocery shopping and and every person that you meet, you must understand it is not by accident that you are in these places. It is not by accident that you are talking to these people. It is not by accident that certain children, that it's not by accident that certain students, it's not by accident that certain parents, that certain co-workers, that you know the person at Walmart on a first name basis. Why is it not an accident? Because God is trying to tell you, you have an assignment to preach the gospel. Somebody needs to, and God says, I may send you somewhere that you may not particularly like for a little bit. You may, I may send you somewhere that you don't want to talk about, but, and, and you want to get out and that's fine. And God says, I'm going to bring you out. But for the time being, somebody needs to know me at your job. Somebody needs to know me at the grocery store. Somebody needs to, to know, somebody needs to know me. And let me encourage the Phillips in the room. God doesn't place you for no reason, not by accident, but God places you, God puts you in places as his ambassador to tell someone about him. Anywhere God places you, there is an assignment to share the gospel with someone. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are all on assignment. And that assignment may require us to be sent to unfamiliar places. But when we are sent, we must understand that we are ambassadors to preach the gospel. 
I pray that made sense. If it doesn't, rewind it and watch it again. That's the whole purpose of it. Can I go a step further? Watch me now. I'm almost through. I'm almost through. I don't have a lot today. I don't think I've been doing a lot. But anyway, watch. And when he sends you, watch me, you are a conduit of his love. One more time. And when God sends you, you are a conduit of his love. What do you mean, pastor? Let's look at verse 26 and 27. I want to I look at verse 26 and 27. Uh, actually, no, 20, 26 is fine. 20, 26 is fine. Verse 26. Watch what he says. Now, an angel of the Lord. Now, now we've read this before, but I, I, there is another point I would like to make. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Now, you're saying, Pastor, we know read that verse at least three times. What, what, uh, what, what is different here? Well, Remember, I, I, God told Philip, leave the revival, the revival happening with the Samaritans, go down to Gaza, walk in the desert, into Philistine territory to reach the people that have never heard of me. Pastor, that ain't deep. That ain't deep. You ain't, you ain't say nothing. You, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Watch. It, it's really not deep. Here's my point. God sends Philip. He, wow, uh, two, uh, uh, three words, or rather two, uh, three. God sends, the, 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 the big word is sends Philip. And this is what I mean that when I, when I say that we are a conduit of God's love. He says, Philip, I need you to leave the places that are already occupied with my gospel to reach the person that has never heard of me. Stay with me. I know you're like this. You're repeating yourself. No, I'm making a point. Notice God doesn't say, Philip, wait for him to come to get to Jerusalem. He'll come around. Go. You, you wait for him. You keep doing what you're doing over here with John and Peter. And, and eventually when the people come around, then you can spread the gospel. No, God looks at Philip and he says, go down, rise and go down to Gaza. Oh, look at the love of God. What's your point, Pastor? Here's my point. God, God is, uh, evangelism does not wait for people to show up, but we pursue. And that's what we find in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is why we are conduits of his love. We see it in the gospel and we see it throughout the Bible and it is shown in our evangelism. What do you mean by that, Pastor? The gospel of Jesus Christ can be summed up, summed up like this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have every, for ha will have eternal life. God didn't look at the world and say, I see a few good people. Maybe I can die for them. Some of them deserve it. No, he said, I'm going to give them my son, even, even though right now they are my enemies. First John 4, 19. We love because he because he first loved us the gospel is God pursuing humanity even when we didn't ask to be pursued God pursued us God came after us God uh, loved us when we weren't looking for him and God shows his love through us for others as we share the gospel with others because God is using us to pursue them one more time because I know I said a lot Watch me. I'm going to say it a little slow because I know I got put a lot of words in there. God shows his love through us, through us for others as we share the gospel with others because God is using us to pursue them. We are conduits of God's love and we are pursuing people to give them the gospel because God is using us to say to say to them, I love you. God is, God is literally saying, give them the gospel because I am pursuing them. That's why God looks at Philip and he says, rise and go down to Gaza. Why? Because I'm pursuing this man. I'm pursuing this woman. I want them to know me. You don't believe me? It's, the, it's, it's what Jesus did for us. Jesus stepped out of heaven. Hey, 
Emmanuel, God is with us. Died for our sins. All because of what? His love. Romans chapter 5 verse 11 says that this was love. That God died for us. That was the epitome of love. The cross of Jesus Christ. And the same God who pursued you uh, uh, so that we would be saved. This same God is telling us, show my love to people by giving them the gospel. Because I'm pursuing them. Same way I pursue you. God wants us to pursue these people. That's why in the Great Commission, the first word in Great Commission, Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the first word says, go. He doesn't say wait, not wait for it to be convenient, but go, pursue, go after, because he loves them. We are conduits of God's love. We, we serve as a channel or a vessel to show people God loves you and he wants to save you. And we pursue them to give them the gospel so that they will see and know God's love through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It gets better. I, 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 let, let me read verse 26 to 29. That's, that's, the, that's the chunk of our verse. But I want you, uh, just, just bear with me. I know I kept reading the verse, but it, uh, bear with me. Look at verse 26 and 29. It, it rocks your world. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. Oh, that's good news. Pastor, what did you read? Are you ready for this? Here it is. You, I read all those verses. And if you actually read the rest of Acts chapter 8, the remainder of it from Acts chapter 8, verse 26, all the way to 40, the whole point of this passage is for one person. Woo! The whole point of this passage is for one person. Philip walks in the desert. He, 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 he walks into Philistine territory, leaves Peter and John all to talk to one person. Hallelujah. He, he, he does all this just you, you would think it would be better for him to go and visit an, uh, another 50 people like he did in the beginning of Acts chapter 8. You know, villages and villages of people getting saved, baptizing people left and right. Oh no, Philip did all that for one person. Philip does all this work just for one person to hear the gospel. Let me encourage someone. You may be saying, Pastor, I've been praying and talking with this one person for weeks, months, Maybe even years. And it feels like a waste of time. They aren't ignoring me. They, they aren't running away. They're not rejecting the gospel. They, they, they listen to me, but it just seems like they, they haven't turned the corner. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Keep praying. Keep, keep. Don't waste. Don't, uh, uh, it's not a waste of time. Keep talking to them. Why? Because Jesus shows us in Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. That God is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a shepherd that chases after, pursues after his lost sheep. Oh, yes. Have you ever read the parable of the lost sheep where Jesus leaves the 99 for the one? Luke chapter 15 verses 4 through 7 says, What man of you, this is Jesus talking, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more and more joy in heaven 
over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who needs no repentance. You may think it is a waste of time, but God is saying, no, I want you to keep working on that one. You may be saying, God, I don't have a track list of people that I brought to you, but God says, that's all right. I need you just keep on working on that one. Why? Because God says, I leave the 99 for the one. God says, work on that one because I'm all about leaving those that already are saved, but going after the one that knows me. You may be saying, I've done too much. God, I've done so much trying to get to this one person. God says, that's all right. You ain't do too much because that one is worth it. God, Luke chapter 15 tells us God values the one. The text says that all of heaven, literally all of heaven, angels rejoice when the one comes to repentance. God says, don't get caught up in, in, in churches that are being maxed out. Praise God for those churches. But God says, if you just work on one, I'm pleased. God says, I want the one. God says, if you only get one, God says, then your work was well put it, then, 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 then job well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. There are some people that have been praying for the one. God says, keep praying for the one. Because God says that one is very important. That one is valuable to me. You may, you may not, maybe you spend the rest of your life talking to one. God says, don't you give up. Don't you think it's a waste of time. Why? God says, I want that one. <sighs> he is a great shepherd that leaves the 99 for the one. I'm done, church. I'm done. I done talked too much already. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you alone. Evangelism is intentional. Evangelism reminds us that we are ambassadors on assignment, and it may require God to send us to irregular places. We are conduits of God's love, and his love is seen in leaving the 99 to pursue the one. And finally, Evangelism brings the church to the person. Last point. Evangelism brings the church to the person. Let's get to the person that all this fuss is over. Verse 27. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem. He had come to Jerusalem and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The, the, let me, let's, uh, let's remember, uh, the, of course, the remainder of chapter 8 is all about this Ethiopian eunuch. Let's, give a, let's see what all the fuss is about about this guy. The, the, uh, uh, this man, he is an Ethiopian eunuch, uh, for the record, Ethi, uh, Ethiopia, or Ethi, the Ethiopian eunuch, where he's from is actually Egypt, so he's, uh, he's, that's Africa. He, he's a, he was a brother, amen, he was a brother. Uh, uh, but he was the treasurer of the uh, he was the treasurer of the queen of the Ethiopians, whose name was Candace. So his job he was he was the trustee, if you will. His job was to hold the money, amen. But but because it, uh, uh, because he was a eunuch, watch what happens. According to Deuteronomy chapter twenty three verse one, because he was a eunuch, he was not allowed. He was, first of all he was a Gentile. He was a Gentile, and usually back when. When a Gentile wanted to be saved before uh, uh, Acts 20, uh, before uh, uh, Jesus comes, before the New Testament, when uh, when a Gentile wanted to be saved, it means they would convert their religious beliefs to the ways of the Jews. So in in a way, they would literally become a Jew. Some would even go as far as to be circumcised so that they could become a Jew, so they could say, "I am a part of." Israel. Well, this man couldn't do that. He is a eunuch. And so because he was a eunuch, he was not able, according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, he was not able, watch this, he wasn't able to go and worship in the temple. He wasn't allowed to walk in. So, 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 watch this. So the understanding that he wanted from the scriptures, he couldn't get. Why? He couldn't walk into the temple. So the text, so notice what the text says, and it actually can be very heartbreaking to think that this man is traveling in a chariot, he's reading his Bible, and we're going to get to more of what happens next week, but he's reading his Bible, and he has every desire to know more about God, but he can't get into the church. He, he, and, and, and then watch this, he's in this chariot, he travels all these miles to just, to just, to just stand outside. 
Oh, he comes all this way just to sit in the overflow, just to sit down and look, worship a God that he doesn't really understand. He doesn't know, but he but he wants to know. He has a desire, but even uh, even the scripture we're going to say, we'll find out next week that he doesn't even understand the scriptures. He's just reading to the best of his ability. But what I love about God, God, God says, you if you you can't get into the church, but Philip, go ahead. I'm gonna send the church to him. God, th this is what I love about God. That's that pursuing again. He says you can't get to the church, but that's all right. God says I'll bring the church to you. What's the point? Pastor, this is the point that I am making. Many of us would invite people to church, and yes, we should continue to do that, but I believe God is calling us to up the ante here. I believe that God is telling us that we need to get to a place where we don't just say, uh, uh, come to my church. Truthfully, we can't even do that now, but God is saying it's time for us to have a conversation. Why? Because the truth of the matter is for whatever the reason, People may not come into the church. They can't come into the church now, even after COVID. People may not come into the church for whatever the reason. They have their reason, church hurt, whatever the case may be. It doesn't excuse them for not coming to the church, but for whatever the reason, they won't come. But that does not deny them the gospel. I'm challenging you, and the word challenges all of us. I'm in the boat with you. God is calling us. Maybe we need to have more of a conversation. Maybe, 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 watch this. Maybe they need to hear the gospel before they even come into the church. That's, that's what at, uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 26 is telling us about Philip and the Ethiopian. When, when people can't come into the church to hear the gospel, God says, I need the church to go out to them and give them the gospel. You heard me say this before. If this reminds us that the church is not a building but a people, the gospel, watch me, the, the proclamation of the gospel should not be dependent upon the people in the building. Help me, Holy Spirit. The proclamation of the gospel should not be dependent upon the people in the building. What do you mean by that, Pastor? What I mean is the people that are hearing the gospel should not, uh, the people shouldn't have to come to a meeting place to hear the gospel. But the body of Christ, the church, should be going out giving the gospel. Am I saying don't invite people to church? Absolutely not. I'm saying absolutely you invite, invite people to church when God brings us back. Yes, invite people. Yes, invite people to your church. Yes, share the videos. Absolutely. But, but, but I believe that God is pushing us, pushing us a little more and saying maybe you need to have a conversation. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to go a little forward. Then I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But, 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 but maybe you need to ask yourself, and we're going to get to this next week, but, but, but do you know how to explain the gospel? You have a Bible. You, you have a Bible in your hand. You have a Bible in your home. If somebody were to ask you, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you explain it to them? That's, that's the conversation that I'm talking about. That's the conversation that he even has, actually, Philip has in Acts chapter 8. He has a conversation about the Redeemer of our souls, Jesus Christ. And if people are coming to you and asking these questions, or you see your assignment, are we ready to give them the gospel? Are we ready to tell them that Jesus died for sinners like you and me? He was the substitute for our sin. Are we ready to have those conversations? Because I believe that God is pushing us to have those conversations so that, so that we don't have to wait for them to get in here before they hear the gospel. But could it be that God is saying, go get them, go to them, bring the church, the body of Christ to them and tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is not a building, but a people. And we, the church, must continue to spread the gospel to our neighbors, our friends, and our family members. God calls us to evangelize, to be intentional, to be ambassadors, to be conduits of his love, to leave the 99, to go after the one, and to bring the church to them and share the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, O oh Lord, that 
uh, though this word might have been tough, maybe it was more practical, maybe it cut a little bit and challenged us, but at the end of the day, it is your word, and I pray now, Lord, that you would change us with your word. Lord, that we would get deep into your word and even have a desire to understand your word. And, and as Peter would say, make a defense for all to make a defense for why we hope in what we hope in, which is you, Jesus. Would you help us? Oh, God. And, uh, and Lord, I pray that even we would begin to 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 uh, to uh, have these conversations. Lord, uh, 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 and, and, to, and to have these conversations with people. And even when we get back, oh God, with COVID, oh Lord, that we would continue to have these conversations. Lord, I, we look forward to inviting people to church. But Lord, would you work in our hearts that we would take it to the next step, that we wouldn't be afraid to have these conversations, that we would purposely and intentionally prepare ourselves to have these conversations, to tell people about Jesus, to tell sinners, come, Jesus is here waiting to save you from your sins. Lord, would you touch our hearts? Would you continue to change us? Would you continue to be with us? Would you continue to cover us? And Lord, we're praying that you would heal our land, that you would remove COVID, oh Lord, so we can get back into this house in fellowship together. Lord, I pray, bless your word and bless the seed, God. I pray that this seed fell on good ground and that, Lord, it would take root in their hearts, Lord, that we would be ambassadors for you as we are sojourning in this world. Lord, we love you. We bless you and we give you glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Grace and peace, church. God bless you. I want to thank you for listening to the word. We're praying that the word of God edified you. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, we want to invite you. We want to invite you to know Christ as your Savior. A couple of things that we need to do here is simple is that uh, you need, we need to confess our sins. Uh, uh, confess and say, Lord, I have sin in my life. And I need that sin removed. And the only way that that sin can be removed is when we confess that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and he was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So you simply just need to say, Lord, I have sins. Forgive me for those sins. I receive you as Savior, and I believe by faith that you are Lord and that you are the Lord of my life and you have redeemed me from my sins. And just like that, you have salvation. Just like that, you know the Lord for yourself. Uh, one thing that we've learned, uh, and, and we know at Union here at our church, uh, uh, we would uh, uh, we would love for you to be a part of our church. But at the same time, um, if you wish to go to another church or you want uh, uh, know someone else, that's fine too. But one thing is certain, and, and, uh, you don't have to be here to be saved. Uh, you know the Lord for yourself. So uh, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, I would uh, advise you to go to our email. Uh, our email is unionbaptist.southriverNJ at gmail.com. That's unionbaptist.southriverNJ at gmail.com. If you have any questions, concerns, or if you just, uh, uh, even during this pandemic, you want to reach out and say, I want to be a part of this great church, you can do that as well. And we will contact, be in contact with you, and uh, we'll give you information on how to join the church and whatnot. Amen. I pray all is well with you. Uh, grace and peace.